Okay, I think we're live. Let's adjust the camera here. Hi, everyone. It's so good to see you and welcome. Thank you for joining me. It is uh, 834 on Tuesday, October 13th. Um, I'm Marcy Brockman and you're tuning in for Ask Me Anything. This is our third R. It's just me. I don't know where I'm trying to be fancy. It's uh, my third episode of Ask Me Anything. I just started this uh, three weeks ago, Tuesday. Um, it happened sort of as a lark. Uh, about a month ago, I was trying to figure out how to do Facebook Live. Um, if I could get Facebook Live to work through Zoom or something, I forget exactly why. And uh, and randomly, without any preparation at all, I had no makeup on, my hair was a wreck, I was sitting in the living room chatting with my husband, and then suddenly I was live on Facebook. And before I knew it, I had like 16 or 18 people or something watching the video, and a few people were commenting and asking questions, and suddenly I was like, hmm, I think maybe I have something here. It was very organic, and I decided at that moment, with my husband's urging, or support, uh, he's always my biggest supporter, that I would start this Ask Me Anything uh, series. Why not? As long as people are going to watch, as long as people keep asking me questions, I am absolutely uh, hog wild jumping in with both feet, ans answering them with uh, as much gusto and sincerity and kindness and of as much of my hard won 52 years of life experience. <clears throat> Suddenly congested. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm sure that was really loud coming out of my mic. Um, all right, so it's Tuesday. I wonder who we have with us here. Actually, I think if I go on my actual Facebook page, although I don't want to watch myself while this is happening, I think I can see comments. Hey, I wonder who we have with us here. Actually, I think No, I guess not. I don't know. That's really awkward and strange. Sorry, no one wants to watch that. Um so I was thinking, you know, as I was uh brushing my bangs and fixing my lipstick before I just went live here, I was thinking, you know, what I really need is a theme song. I need some sort of musical intro or something that might double as an outro. I don't know if that's a thing or uh, or what. So if anyone has any ideas about theme songs, uh, let me know. Uh, make so in, uh, Let me know in the comments. Also, if you're here and you're watching, uh, please say hello and tell me where you're from if I don't already know. Um, that would be fun to know who is watching. So ask me anything. All right, I have um, two questions or three questions. Um, I left, keep, no, it's three questions. <clears throat> I have uh, a couple of people who uh, sent, uh, who asked one question in person, and then two people who asked questions um, via online communication. So I have a question here. Um, as a person who struggled, I actually wrote it down on a piece of paper, as a person who struggled with um, with an, a difficult mother, addiction and abuse, what did I do differently as a mom to my kids? In other words, what did I learn from my experience with my mother and my own upbringing as a daughter? What did I do differently <clears throat> when I was raising my own kids? Um, I talk about this a lot in Permission to Land. Um, one thing that I absolutely knew from a very young age, I'm talking single digits, like five, six years old. One thing that I absolutely knew was that I wanted to be a mom more than anything, more than I could imagine myself in any particular career, more than I could imagine myself married. None of that mattered as much as my need to be a mother. I knew from a very young age that I was going to be a good mom, an exceptional mom. Um, but 
But my own mother, who I loved despite all of her shortcomings and who's and who I I have come to grow in compassion for her since she died seven years ago, much more so than I ever had while she was alive. Um, I guess while she was alive, the hurt was ongoing. And since she's passed, I've figured out how to get some closure on my own. I've figured out how to separate the emotionality of the emotionally abused, neglected daughter whose mom chose drugs, opiates, um, prescription drugs over her and her grandchildren. You know, that's impossible to get over or almost impossible to get over, but definitely possible. Um, so so my mom, you uh, if you've tuned in to any of my videos on the, my YouTube channel, What's Up Marcy, um, if you've watched any of the videos I've posted on Instagram at Marcy Brockman 27 or um, any of the other various videos I've posted here and or you've read my memoir, Permission to Land, you'd know that my mom was a generous, loving caring and yet very shy and self-conscious person. She never sort of figured out how to um, get over that negative self-talk. She never figured out, even though she saw dozens of therapists, she never figured out how she never figured out that she was the one who was responsible for her own happiness and that she couldn't expect others to make her happy. She couldn't expect others to know what she wanted if she herself didn't know what she wanted. Um, nobody could read her mind. And it was difficult being her daughter. She had all these unrealized ambitions, all these unrealized ideas about what she wanted her life to look like. And no impetus, no momentum, no real actionable ability to do anything about any of them. So what what does Carl Jung say that the, the most disastrous thing for a child is the unrealized life of a parent? Here it is. Um, she struggled with narcissism. She... I, in turn, struggled with her narcissism. She was an undiagnosed bipolar, which meant that she didn't believe any of the therapists or psychologists that she ever saw in her whole life who had suggested that maybe medication or the right medication or behavioral management, et cetera, et cetera, was going to do any good for her. And she, um, she just couldn't get out of her own way. And she medicated herself with anything that she could get her hands on. Um, she didn't turn to alcohol because she had kidney stones too. And she was told that alcohol was going to make more kidney stones. So instead she returned, she, she turned to prescription meds. She figures, you know, if a doctor prescribed them, then they're okay, no matter how much you take or what combination you take them. Um, so I never really knew growing up which mom I was going to get. Was she going to be... My metaphor always was, was she going to be um, Mary Poppins or Cruella DeVille that day? You know, I, I never knew. Um, from moment to moment, hour to hour, day to day, never knew. Um, when she had her manic highs and she was happy and and in a, in a good mood and so on, she was pretty amazing. Um, but uh, when she had her lows, which could last anywhere from an hour to days or weeks or months, um, she was not anybody you'd ever want to be around. So how did I, I'm digressing, how did I figure out how to not bring this forward into my children's life? How did I raise them differently? Um, I know there are two people watching. I see you. Why don't you say hi? Say hello. There, used, there were four. I guess I... I get there were four people. Um, anyway, so how did I bring it 
stop the intergenerationality of it all. Uh, mostly I did it through my own therapy, through um, writing. I've been, hey, Carrie, nice to see you. I'm answering your question, actually. Um, I've been writing in a journal for 30 some odd years, since 1985 and four or five. And uh, I've been on and off in therapy since I was like in my early 20s. I think I've spent most of my adult life in therapy with three different therapists. And I've learned a lot of stuff, um, mostly that I had to forgive myself for putting for being the kid and not being able to fix my mother. You know, I had to realize that. Hey, Mary. So good to see you. I'm glad you enjoyed the book. That's awesome. Doing these live things is weird because you're interrupting to interact with the people who are being nice enough to respond and not lose the continuity of what I'm saying. It's kind of difficult. I feel like I'm teaching. Anyway. So when my children were born, I made sure that no matter what decision I was making, I was putting their needs first. Um, that I was going to raise them in a non-judgmental, accepting, kind, open-hearted, generous way. Um, that I was going to raise them to trust that what I said is what I was going to do that my word is my bond, that if I promised something, I was going to do everything that I could do to make it happen. Um, my mom always said that she wanted me to feel safe coming to her to chat with her or talk to her about anything that was bothering me. And, and I think on some level, she believed herself. She believed it when she was saying that to me. And there were a few times where I really needed help and decided to try to trust her to be there for me. And she wasn't. She was mean and belligerent and judgmental and awful and made me feel about this big. And and then, you know, through that, you know, she was still there to help me pick up the pieces or whatever it was, even though she was belittling me the whole time. But then she would use it against me years later. And I, I remember, you know, asking her for something or and she'd be like, well, you remember that time when you were 16 and I or remember that time when you needed me when you were 17 and I and I'm like that mom, I'm 35. Why are we bringing that up now? But she she just always did that sort of thing. It was crazy. You know, she'd, you know, always show up with the when my kids were really small, she'd always show up with gifts and she would say, uh, and then the and then the kids would sort of get used to when Nana shows up that we're going to get a present. And then they would ask if she would come without a present. They would ask where the present was and then she'd get angry at them. But I'd have to point out that she's the one who conditioned them, trained them to actually expect that, that that's what happens with three and four year olds. You know, um, you condition them and they're going to behave that way. Um, but she'd say things like, you know, come and give me a hug. And then if they didn't, because they were just being kids or in the middle of building something with Legos or something, she'd say, well, next time you want so and so don't come to me. Like really manipulative, passive aggressive or aggressive aggressive crap. And, and I wasn't raising them that way. We had routines, we had, we had thing, uh, uh, things in our lives, touchstones in our lives that are that that my kids could count on. You know, we read three or four stories a night in bed. Um, we ate meals at a specific time that had different colors on every plate. You know, kids only got dessert if they, we didn't really have dessert often, but you know, only get dessert if they ate enough. They didn't have to clean their plate, you know, um, but they needed to eat enough. Uh, homework and have to's always came before want to's. Um, you're not going to go out to play until your math homework's done. It's just kind of the way it is. Um, I was a class mom whenever I could be. As a working mom, that was sort of hard. I was a Boy Scout leader. I was a Cub Scout leader. I was a Girl Scout leader. 
I schlepped to dance lessons and all sorts of other things. And I was a, a single mom for most of this. I got divorced from their father when they were in very early elementary school. Um, and he has his good points, but in in a lot of psychological ways was exactly like my mom. And so I felt like the way I was raising them, I had to counteract both of them. And it was hard because they are both sensitive and empathetic and kind and very observant. And I like to think from my training, emotionally intelligent. And so they'd ask me questions like, why did Nana do that? Or why did dad do that? And I have no answer. They they did what they did. I, I don't think either one of them is malicious. I think that they did their best with the tools that they had and the tools that they had were different and not didn't play well with others, you know. Anyway, so um, that's sort of the long and the short of it. There really isn't an easy answer. Parenting is the most complicated, interconnected web of timelines and behavior and love than there ever could be, I think. That the one the one big thing, though, is that I always let my children's needs be my guide. When I was getting divorced from their father, I put their needs in front of everything else. I mean, I, 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 you'd think, well, you know, you're getting divorced, so you're, I was putting my needs ahead of them. But, but ultimately, I decided to get divorced when I realized that I wouldn't want my marriage for either of my kids, that I wouldn't wish my marriage on anyone, especially anybody that I cared about, especially my children that I didn't want them to be in a relationship like that. And if I didn't want them to be in a relationship like that, I shouldn't give that relationship to them as their template for all of their other relationships. And so me getting a divorce not only saved me, I was only 38 years old, not only saved me from living a life of loneliness and all of that, but I think it's saved, I know, it saved my kids from making those same decisions. Now they're going to make their own mistakes, you know, and and uh, and I'll be there as their safety net forever, but at least they're not going to make that mistake. So that's my very long-winded answer to that question. Um, the second question that I was asked is a very simple, basic question that I think a lot of people struggle with. And the question very simply is, who who are you? Who are you? Somebody asked that question, what's your answer going to be? Someone asks me that question, my my instinct might be, well, I'm a teacher, or I'm an author, or um, I'm a writer for Elephant Journal, or I'm a really good friend. Um, I'm a wife, I'm a mom. These are all things that we do. They're all actions, they're careers, you know, um, What's more important, I think, than what we do is how we do it. So are you somebody who who faces every relationship or every new person that you meet with love and compassion? Are you somebody who treats everybody with respect and non-judgment? Are you somebody who seeks to find the best in other people, who wants to help other people? I think those kinds of descriptions are better than just the, well, I'm a teacher thing, you know? Well, what kind of a teacher are you? What kind of a mom are you? What kind of a project manager are you? What kind of a doctor are you? What kind of a crossing guard are you? What kind of a uh, a chef are you? You know, it doesn't really matter. I, I think it's more the description of who we actually are that makes the most sense, that actually gets to the heart of who a person is instead of just their career. So as you're thinking about the answer to this question, who are you? I want you to think about those things, the kind of person that you are. Who are you in your heart? You know, if you have trouble answering the question, think of your best friend or 
your spouse, assuming you love them um, and they love you, um, somebody who loves you, how would they describe you? You know, oh, here's my friend Marcy. She is what? You know, how, how would they describe you? And then use that as your answer if you can't think of it yourself. Okay. So the third question is a little also heavy. Um, how do you cope with the grief of losing a parent? Um, I had a former student whose parent died recently, and I, um, when is today, the 13th, so exactly a week ago, um, on the 7th of October, it was the seventh anniversary of my mother's death. And I did make a little, a short video um, last week on, on her, on the actual anniversary, saying that grief isn't linear. And I think that, you know, people, we're all very quick to judge ourselves. And there is no one way to grieve. There is no plan. There's no schedule. It is what it is. You know, when the person who we deeply care about dies, we're left with this big hole in our heart. We're left feeling empty. We're left imagining, remembering, hoping it could have been different. And that hole, that ache in your chest, as you go through the immediate aftermath is, is just, I, I can't even, I can't even come up with a description, but it halts you in your tracks. It, it pulls all the breath out of your lungs. It, it just cuts you to the quick. And you have to not avoid, you can't avoid feeling negative feelings, feeling sad, feeling angry, feeling grief, mourning, feeling angry. You, you can't expect to live a full and vibrant life, to live an authentic life, if you're only allowing and acknowledging happy feelings. Um, you have to process how you feel through all of them, even the awful shitty ones. Um, the only way out is through. It's tattooed on my arm for a reason, to remind me. The only way out is through. Um, and over time, it sounds cliche, that time heals all wounds. I think that's a Shakespearean thing. Um, and to a degree, it does. You know, you, you get a little time, you get a little distance emotionally, you get a little distance chronologically, you get a little distance spiritually, and it does get slightly less easy. It's not as sharp or acute. The, the, instead of ripping your heart out, maybe it's just a dull ache, you know? And I, I think that you get a little closure if you're lucky. You get to know who the person is on a different in a different way after they're gone through talking to other people and hearing stories you might not have heard and you know i i i imagine how life would be if my mom was still around and i i wouldn't want her around anymore unless she was healthy if I was going to get back the exact mom I had when she died, then she's sorry to say this, but it's true. She's better off where she is, um, wherever that is. And uh, yeah, Mary says a time he helps you adjust to a new normal, but anniversaries and birthdays are hard. Yeah, yeah, you do adjust to a new normal. You do sort of figure out how to go on without them and when you get to milestones like Christmases or Hanukkahs or Easter's or Passover's or Thanksgiving's or their birthday or your birthday or Mother's Day or Father's Day or whatever any of those um, milestone holidays are or those customary holidays are, it does get difficult because you imagine what life would be like with them around still. 
you know, like, like my, I was just, I talked to my mother a lot and I don't know if she can hear me or what. Um, but you know, as my kids get older, I tell her about things that they're doing and how proud I know she is of them. And that helps me, you know, how I don't know how she would react to this book. I think on one level, she would have been really proud that I wrote it. And it doesn't really paint her in a very good light. So I think she would have been really, really pissed, really pissed. But I think, you know, if you gain a bit of wisdom or a whole lot of wisdom after your life is over, um, I would imagine that she now would look back at this book and be okay with it. Um, one day I'll make a video about my psychic experience. It's a whole chapter in my, my memoir, but that's another story. Um, yeah, I think, I think if there's anything that I can say, it's just that time and distance does make it a little bit easier, except for milestone events. And, and then you have to still have to feel, you still have to go through the feeling and, and acknowledge it and name it and acknowledge it and feel it, maybe write about it, talk to somebody you care about about it, talk to somebody you trust about it and and move on. And it, it'll it'll sort of ebb and flow as you go. Um, so that's really all I have to say about that right now. It's not an easy thing by any means. But uh, so those are three questions. Um, anybody who is here watching, who is joining us or joining me, joining us, have anything they want to ask? It is ask me anything. I am open to any conversation and any question. Anyone have anything? No one's typing. So maybe that's it. All right. So um, it was lovely chatting with you tonight. I am so grateful that you have joined me. And, um, and I hope that you will join keep continue to join me on Tuesday evenings at 830. And that you will tell your friends and have them come. Um, all the videos are recorded. Uh, they're live and they're recorded and they will live here on my Facebook page. And they will also live on my YouTube channel, What's Up Marcy. So you can find them all there along with my book talk Sundays for a few months now, three or four months, I've been doing uh, a book talk on Sundays. I pick a book, fiction, nonfiction, current, old, whatever that I like, or that I've taught or that have means something to me uh, as meaningful, etc. And I do um, a talk about about the book. I do that sometime every Sunday. And um, every other Thursday afternoon at four, Carrie Arend, who's my friend from Raleigh, North Carolina, who is here. Um, where is the date? Here. She's here watching this. Um, on October 22nd, I wrote it down, we are going to be talking about college admissions essays and what students should, should write in essays to apply to uh, undergrad and graduate school. Um, so between the two of us, we have quite a bit of experience and can talk to you and your kids or students or friends or cousins or nephews or whoever about nieces, etc., about uh, college admissions essay, about writing that very pivotal thing. So we've got a lot going on. A lot going on. So uh, books, permission to land and the companion journal permission to land personal transformation through writing are available on my website marcybrockman.com they're available at bookshop which is an independent bookseller they are available at book review right here on long island in person at, in the store and online and anywhere else that books are sold um amazon barnes and noble powell's ibooks etc cetera, etc cetera. and my audiobook for the memoir, Permission to Land, Searching for Love, Home and Belonging, is finished and uploaded to ACX, and I'm waiting for approval, but it should be completely fine. It was engineered and produced by my very good friend, uh, Frank Vetterosa, and I'm really, really excited. Um, 
I kind of want to do a whole new launch party all over again just to celebrate the audiobook because this has been since May. Uh, I've been working on this. I recorded the whole thing myself and uh, I even sang in it, scarily enough. Um, so, so yeah, so all of that's coming. So thank you very, very much from the bottom of my heart for joining me for the third episode of Ask Me Anything. I hope that you enjoyed the conversation and please send me your questions. You can either send them through Facebook Messenger uh, to me, Marcy Brockman. You can email them to me at marcybrockman at gmail.com. And remember, Brockman has two N's, B-R-O-C-K-M-A-N-N. Um, and that's, that's that. You can also Instagram message me at uh, Marcy Brockman 27. I think that's about it. I think that's enough options. So I will see you next Tuesday. Uh, actually, I'll see you Sunday for Book Talk Sunday, but then I'll see you next Tuesday right here live at 830 for Ask Me Anything. Thanks so much for being here. Bye.